السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين As always we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sent to us the Quran and revealed to us this amazing message and all of the stories and lessons that it contains therein and we send our salutations and peace and blessings upon our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the guidance to all of mankind we were on the tafsir of Surah Al-Kahf and we were going to start in this episode on verse number 12 of Surah Al-Kahf and we were speaking about the story of the people of the cave and how Allah Azza wa Jalla in the first four or four, five verses of this story he gives a summary of the story of the people of the cave and he has mentioned already a number of important components in the previous verses that we discussed namely that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how they were an amazing sign of Allah Azza wa Jalla the people of the cave how these people of the cave had to go and seek refuge in a cave and they made a dua therein of seeking mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking Allah for his guidance and how Allah azza wa jalla then responded to that guidance by giving them a miracle and a sign that involved sleep and it would be a heavy cast sleep upon them in verse number 12 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then continues with this summary and he says a'udhu billahi min shaytanir rajeem ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَاهُمْ لِنَعْلَمَ أَيُّ الْحِزْبَيْنِ أَحْصَى لِمَا لَبِثُوا أَمَدًا And then we would awaken them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an uses the word ba'ath which means to resurrect. Even though they didn't die, but they were in a very long and deep sleep. And that is because as the Prophet said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sleep is the brother of death. When you go to sleep, your soul travels and you have dreams and so on it is similar to death Allah Azza wa mentions in the Quran Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who takes away the souls at the time of death and those that do not die their souls are returned to them after their sleep so Allah Azza wa mentions in the Quran that sleep and death are similar in some regards and they are closely related to one another these people slept for many, many years, as we will come and find out later that it was, in fact, centuries. So Allah Azza wa Jal says in another important lesson that in order for this sign and this miracle to be completed, they had to awake. Because if they had just stayed asleep for 300 years and plus, many centuries, and then after that sleep, they simply died in that state of sleep, that miracle wouldn't be known to anyone. Or if they had awoken, and then they had just died without anyone seeing or knowing or interacting with them, they, again, the miracle would be incomplete. So from the perfection or the completion of this miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he allows people to realize that it is a miracle, to see that it is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we use the word miracle not in the sense of mu'jiza, which is a miracle that is given to the prophets and messengers of Allah, but rather it is a karama. It is a type of miracle that is given to those people who are lesser in, in, in status than the prophets and messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a karama is something which can be given to anybody other than the prophets of Allah from the believers. So the prophets of Allah azza wa jal have mu'jizat. And those people who are the awliya of Allah, they have karamat. These people of the cave were given this type of miracle, this karama. So Allah azza wa jal wanted it to be complete by them being discovered by people knowing their story and the reality of what happened. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَاهُ And then we cause them to awake. لِنَعْلَمَ أَيُّ الْحِزْبَيْنِ أَحْصَى لِمَا لَبِثُ أَمَدًا So that the two groups from amongst them would be able to know how long they truly slept for. As we will see later on in the story, as Allah will mention again, when these people awake, the people of the cave, they dispute amongst themselves as to how long they slept. And from the amazing aspects of this miracle is that this miracle was such that even though they slept for centuries, they didn't feel as if they had slept for more than a day or so. And because they differed as to whether it was a part of a day or a full day or what it was, Allah says we showed them because the miracle is not only for other people who will discover them, but for them as well. Why for them? The miracle is for them to show them how Allah protects them, how Allah gave them his mercy how Allah made them steadfast, how Allah Azza wa Jal helped them because they are from his awliya. And it is a miracle for others, a lesson for them because they will see 
the power and the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a sign that should bring them closer to Allah azza wa jal. ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَاهُمْ لِنَعْلَمَ أَيُّ الْحِزْبَيْنِ أَحْصَى Which one of those two groups had a better calculation, a better awareness, لِمَا لَبِثُوا amada As to the length of time that they passed within that cave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ نَبَأَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَزِدْنَاهُمْ هُدَى Indeed, we, meaning Allah, we relay their story to you in truth. Allah says that this story is not a fable that is made up. It is not just something that you tell to your children to get them to sleep. It is not just something which Allah Azza wa Jal has mentioned to fill up the pages and the words of the Quran. نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ نَبَأَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ This is a true story that we relay to you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to your ummah and to your followers after you. And this is from the main aspects of the stories of the Qur'an. Allah is mentioning the unique attributes of the stories of the Qur'an. Number one is that they are always truthful. Allah doesn't relay in the Qur'an lies or fairy tales or things which are mythology. But rather Allah Azza wa Jal tells the truth in all of his stories subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two that they are the most eloquent of stories, the best of stories, as Allah says in Surah Yusuf, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَرِ We have revealed to you the best of stories in the Qur'an. Number three, these stories are stories that are full of lessons. The stories of the Qur'an are not just given simply so that you read them to pass time by, or simply so that it is some form of entertainment or relaxation. The stories of the Qur'an are there to give you lessons and parables, and meanings that you can apply in your life. Allah, knowing the nature of his slaves that he created, Allah mentions stories, but his stories are not some type of Hollywood fantasy, they're not some type of fiction, but rather the stories of Allah are true, and they are meant for you to take benefit from. <laughs> Even though these stories have aspects within them that are different, that are peculiar, that are outside of the, the realms of normality that we are accustomed to, they are true because it is Allah who mentioned them. They are true because they were relayed to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam within the glorious Quran. Allah says, Innahum fityatun amanu bi rabbihim. These were a group of young people. Youngsters again, Allah mentions the words youngsters, fitya. They were young people who from all of their community, everyone within that society, they stood up and they gave up their sins and they sacrificed for the sake of Allah and they worshipped Allah alone. Innahum fitya. They were a group of young men. Amanu bi rabbihim. They believed in Allah. This is Allah mentions at the beginning of Surah Al Kahf, as we said in a previous episode concerning those people who have glad tidings and the promise of Jannah. They are the people who yubashir al ladina amanu. The people who believe and they do righteous deeds. Allah Azza wa Jal says concerning them, Amanu bi Rabbihim, the people of the cave believed in their Lord. And that belief was so strong that they were able to stand up against all of their community. You see, it is easy to stand up against people or it is easy to have a conviction or a belief where no one stands against you. No one challenges you. No one minds. No one cares what you do or don't do. But when everyone around you, from your family, the closest, dearest people to you, to your friends, to your neighbors, to your teachers, and everyone else in the community and your society, when they oppose you willingly and purposefully, and they do so actively, when they oppose you, that is when standing up for what you believe in is something which requires courage and requires strong faith and iman in Allah. So Allah praises them for having strong iman. These people, when they were opposed by their people, they didn't say, no, we made a mistake, no, we changed our minds but rather they continued. So Allah says, وَزِدْنَاهُمْ huda." Because of this, we increased them in guidance. They believed in Allah, Allah blessed them even more. They sought to come closer to Allah, so Allah increased them in guidance. As we know that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the Hadith Al-Qudsi that Allah says, whosoever comes closer to Allah by a hand span, Allah will come closer to him by an arm span. Whosoever walks to Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah will run towards them. This is because Allah Azza wa Jal helps those people who turn to him and he blesses them and he gives them his divine mercy. Inshallah, we're going to take a short break and after the break we will go into 
the rest of the story when Allah now returns to the beginning and goes through it in detail. So please stay with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs>
Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, the famous scholar of tafsir, he mentions in his tafsir the background story, which he takes from Israeliyat, Israelite traditions. Now in our religion, you will find in books of tafsir and in other books, sometimes the scholars quote from Israelite traditions. What are Israelite traditions? They are traditions and narrations that are taken from previous scriptures, from the Torah and the Gospel and so on and so forth. They are taken from the Bible and from other Judeo-Christian works. They are Judeo-Christian narrations known as in Arabic Israeliyat, in English, Israelite traditions. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hadithu an bani Israela wa la haraj. Narrate from the people of Israel, the children of Israel, and there is no harm in doing so. The scholars say that this hadith means that if we come across their narrations, those narrations that oppose our religion, we must reject because they oppose what is in the Quran or what the Prophet ﷺ said explicitly. Those things that we find in their narrations, Judeo-Christian narrations, that conform, they agree with our religion, we must accept. Not because they are their narrations, but because our Quran and our Prophet ﷺ mentioned them to be so as well. And as for everything else that is neither mentioned, neither affirmed, nor denied, they're not confirmed by the Quran and Sunnah, nor are they rejected by the Quran and Sunnah, it is allowed for you to narrate them only. Meaning that you narrate them, but you don't necessarily believe in them. So we don't say it is true, it is 100%. They may be true, they may not be true. Or there may be certain aspects which are true and other aspects which are untrue. So Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the things that he does in his tafsir is he mentions for the background purpose only, he mentions Israelite traditions to give you a better understanding of the story. So I too will narrate that background as is mentioned by Al-Imam Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala in his tafsir but again with this caveat that it is not something that is authentically narrated to us in our tradition in our sunnah or in the Quran so therefore there are aspects which may be correct aspects which may be incorrect and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best he says that these were a group of people number one they didn't know one another so these group of young men who would become the companions of the cave were not people who knew one another initially. They lived in the same community, in the same town, but they were not brothers, they were not friends, they were not relatives or cousins or neighbors. They just happened to live in the same place. And that place had a king who was a tyrant, an evil ruler. And he was a man who was a tyrant and he made people worship gods besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He also mentions that these people were from a kind of a Roman background, a Byzantine or Roman kind of background, and that they were people who came from relatively wealthy or affluent families. They were comfortable in terms of their living. The people of that town used to have a festival, an Eid, a festival day, a celebration when they would come out and they would worship their gods and so on. These group of young men, they didn't know one another, but they felt uncomfortable with the idea of worshiping these gods besides Allah. Each one of them individually felt this way. Just as our Prophet wasallam, and there are many lessons and many parallels that you can draw from the stories of Surah Al-Kahf with the life of our own Prophet wasallam, and perhaps that is the reason Allah knows best that it was also revealed early on because of the parallels between the two things. The Prophet wasallam, at the beginning of Islam, before he became a Prophet, felt uncomfortable with the worship of Quraysh to the idols. So he never used to partake in their festivals. He never used to worship their idols and so on. And before he received revelation, he in fact would go and he would think and meditate in the cave of Hira as we know. So he used to feel uncomfortable. These people of the cave, they too used to feel uncomfortable. So when the day of Eid came, they came out with their families to celebrate and to have this day of festival that they used to have. But very quickly, one of them made an excuse to their family member saying he doesn't feel well, doesn't feel too good. And he left and he went a distance away and he sought to sit down under the shade of a tree. Because he doesn't want to partake in their shirk and so on. But again, he can't say, I don't agree. So he just goes, excuses himself on the pretense that perhaps he's not feeling well, tired, so on and so forth. At the same time, one of the other men from the people of the cave does the same thing. And he too happens to go to the same tree and sit with the first, then the third and the fourth and so on, until the group of young men gathered together. Now again, this is an Israelite tradition. We don't know whether it is correct or incorrect. 
But one of the things that we do know from our sunnah is that the Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Arwahu Junoodun Mujannada. The souls are like army. Some of them are your army members, meaning they're on the same side as you in your army, and others are in the opposing army. Souls sometimes meet together and they click, they become friends instantaneously, they become very close. And other times you meet someone and you don't like them. You back off, you have a bad vibe or a bad feeling about them. Al-Arwah Junood Mujannada. Perhaps Allah knows best these people were Junood Mujannada. They had a similar type of outlook as we know obviously because they all became believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but they were inspired to come and sit in the same place according to this narration. So now they're sitting there together, people who don't really know one another. For some reason, all of them happen to gather at one place at one time. So one of them says, we have all come here for the same reason. But who will be brave enough from amongst us to actually say it out loud? Because they're looking at each other suspiciously. They don't know what's going on. So one of them responds and he says, I don't agree with these gods that our people worship. I want to worship Allah alone. And very quickly, the others in the group, they agree. And they say, yes, we too believe the same. We too feel the same way. We too believe and want to worship, believe in Allah alone and want to worship him alone, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now they become friends. And this bond that they create, they never knew each other before. But now the bond of Islam, the bond of religion and faith is so strong that they will sacrifice for one another. And they will become so close that they will become a group that Allah Azza wa Jal will record their memory until Yawm Al Qiyamah. They will become known as the people of the cave, Ashab Al Kahf. So they used to worship Allah alone in private. They would go out into the middle of the fields or far away from their people and they would go and that's where they would worship Allah where no one could see them because they knew that their people wouldn't agree. Their people worship other gods and even more so the king of that land, of that town, the leader of their people, he is an evil, corrupt, tyrannical king, an oppressor. And if he finds someone who disagrees with him, he will most likely kill them or harm them or torture them or imprison them or whatever he will do, but he will be strict with them. So they are hiding and that is where they are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Until as the narration mentions one day as they are worshipping Allah, a group of people pass by and they happen to see them and they see that they're doing something different. So they come to them and said, what are you doing? Who are you worshipping? Because now they have found out that they are doing something different. They say to them, we will go to the king and we will complain. We will tell him what you are doing. So they go and they tell the king. The king calls these people, these group of young men, and he brings them forward in his court, in his palace, where all of the people are gathered. And he questions them and he says, what are you doing? Who are you worshipping? What is this religion that you are practicing? This is the time now where they have a choice. Remember, we said at the beginning of this surah, trials give you a choice, which is why Allah often mentions opposites within this surah. Gives you a choice. These men have a choice. They could say, no, it was a mistake. It was a misunderstanding. Or they could say, yes, we were doing something, but we don't want to follow that religion anymore. We go back to your religion, O king. We go back to the religion of our people. They have a choice. And that is why Allah begins the story here and he says, وَرَبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ We cause their hearts to be firm. Because now when they had that choice, that mercy that they ask from Allah, and that is why Allah has already mentioned this, that Allah had given them his divine mercy. Allah had given them guidance. وَرَبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ From the benefits of that guidance and that mercy is that Allah makes your heart steadfast. Allah Azza wa Jal gives you that strength of conviction, that courage to stand up for what you believe in. وَرَبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ They weren't afraid, they weren't shy, they weren't embarrassed. They know that this king is evil, tyrannical and oppressor. They know that their people, even those people who are close to them will disagree and they will dislike them. But still, وَرَبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ Not only that, did Allah make their hearts steadfast in their own iman, but then they were able to speak with that strength of iman. إِذْ قَامُوا when they stood, فَقَالُوا And they spoke and they said, رَبُّنَا رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Our Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. The one that we worship is not some idol that has been created, not some stone or tree or anything else. Our Lord is the one who is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. Allah Azza wa Jal. 
created the heavens and the earth. He is the originator of the heavens and the earth. He is the one who is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. He is the one who provides and he gives life and he gives death and he decrees evil and good. He is the all-hearing, the all-knowing, the all-seeing, the most merciful, the most generous, the most kind, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. We will never call upon a God besides him. Because doing so is a grievous statement. And then Allah Azza wa Jal, as we will mention in the next episode, goes on to speak about how they then challenge the views of their people and what would be the response of their people towards them. But we will leave that for the next episode. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.